Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nidus Anarchy series. I'm your host Adam, the CIO of Nidus, and today we are going to be talking about Fordrock Identity Cloud, what it is and what it isn't. So Fordrock Identity Cloud is I want to say relatively the new offering by Fordrock, right? I mean, everyone knows their identity tools, they have, you know, ID, open IDM and AM, and which they then transferred to just identity manager, access manager in their directory services. Um, but now they're pushing very heavily on the identity cloud and they're pushing so heavily that I just got word that I don't think they're even selling the actual on-prem version of the software anymore. Uh, we put out, uh, we had a client of ours ask to, you know, for an RFP from different vendors. So we went to look at Fordrock and they won't even give us a quote for on-prem version. They're only going to give us cloud. So they're definitely double downing on pushing everyone into the Forge cloud. And I know SailPoint has also done very, something very similar as well. So it seems to be a common trend, right? Like, I mean, it makes sense from a Forge Rock's perspective, you know, it's a lot less hassle for them because then you don't have to worry about the maintenance and error handling and handholding and the setup and install and all that kind of stuff from a services perspective uh, for the on-prem version. Um, but then on the other hand, it's obviously not as configurable and there's there's issues that come into there. So we're going to break down a little bit as to what Fordrock is and isn't, right? So what it is, Fordrock is the identity manager, access manager, and directory services all in the cloud. And it is limited. I'll just start out right there. It is not the exact same tool as when you buy the on-prem version. When you buy the on-prem version, you have you know total control and to do whatever you want and set it up however you want. Now in the cloud version, you're stuck with how they do it. One prime example right out of the gate, I don't know if you're familiar with Realms within Fordrock, it's kind of like how you isolate your, your kind of your identity silos. And in the identity cloud version, you only get two, Alpha and Bravo, that's it. So if you're like, hey, look, we have 10 Realms locally, we need to migrate these to the cloud, you can't. You only get two and that's it. You have multiple environments that give you a sandbox environment, a dev stage and a production environment. So if you're, hey, we have five or six environments, well, that goes out the window as well. So, I mean, I, I kind of understand why they limited it down just because from support and functionality, and it's probably something they might, you know, increase later. I just don't know. But that is a severe limitation. And one client of ours, they have over 10 different realms, so there's no way to migrate those to the cloud. But what it does do is it offers a lot of ease of use. I mean, setting this thing up is simple. Literally, you're, st you're, given, an you're given a tenant, you log into the web console for the tenant, and in there, you can then set up everything just as if you would, you know, with regular Fordrock. Now, what's cool is you can still connect to everything that's locally in your data center or in your cloud, Azure, AWS, whatever. So you're just going to do everything via two things. So from the identity perspective, you're going to use a remote connector server. So these RCSs are going to sit locally in your environment, whether that's the cloud or on-prem. And that's going to do the relay for all the provisioning and all the identity tasks. And then from an access standpoint, you have the um, the identity gateway. And there's variations of those as well. Um, there's a also, a, I think it's called the micro, micro identity gateway or something. It's used for like microservices. I'm pretty sure that sits just with like clustering from a Kubernetes perspective. I have not used it, so I don't know, but it's just something to look into. So if you're heavy into the containerization aspect in your environment, check out, I, I'm sure if you Google it, you find out. I think it's called like the, the, mic, the um, the micro identity gateway or something like that. But so it makes it ease of use, right? So now you can use all your own systems. You just set up this remote connector server. You, you set the connector, you install a connector, let's say if it's for an LDAP or whatever, you set that on your little remote connector box and then you configure it to talk to the tenant in the cloud. So now you can control everything from the cloud. It will then say, hey, we're gonna provision accounts into this directory. You can do full synchronization back and forth. So it does have a lot of easy use. I mean, you can stand up your environment super fast, as long as you don't have anything crazy. Now, if you're just gonna say like, hey, we have a crazy customized schema in our LDAP, we need to get all those custom attributes into the identity store in the cloud that, that Fordrock is managing, you can't. So in the managed resources, which is gonna be your identity store in Fordrock Identity Cloud and the core token services, you can't modify that. You have a fixed schema that you have to work with and you are going and you can work with that in the mappings just like you would on, on a local on-prem version. Now, when it comes to um, the access standpoint, you can also, you know, you're used to like the journeys to, to create kind of that authentication flow from beginning to end to determine how a user logs in, right? So with this, you're also restricted in the sense that there's there's given nodes that you use to make decisions. So the decision nodes across the point, but you're, you're locked in with what they give you. 
they do have some flexibility. You can still use scripts. Um, you can still use Groovy scripting uh, from the access manager side, and, and there's still uh, there's custom scripts on the identity side as well that you can implement. Um, but those are also limited. So when you make your class files on the Groovy side, uh, only only class Java class files that are that are on the allowed list that's their term are allowed to be used. And if they're not on there, you can petition with Forgerock to allow a certain class for whatever reason. And I get it because it's like whatever that class is, they probably need to make sure it's not malicious and mess up their, their server infrastructure or something. But but that is, again, another restriction. So I guess the, overall, the common theme here is you're gonna, for ease of use, you're gonna give up customizability, right? So you gotta find where that sweet spot is. Another thing um, is with the directory server, when you wanna sync directories, so if your password hashes stored in the directory are of a standard format, there's a list of about eight or nine standard hashes, those will sync fine. You'll be able to sync good, you know, all, all well. But we actually, one of my clients, they have a custom hash set up for their passwords because of some legacy stuff that they imported, which means it will not synchronize. So we cannot sync the password hashes between the directories, which means we can never get the passwords into the identity store. Now, if you're in the same situation and you want to get it that way, you want to have all your identities in the managed identity store of Forgerock Identity Cloud, what you can do is set up your authentication journey to have a pass-through authentication node on failure of authentication. And then after that, you're gonna have a patch object node to update the, the managed store. So right now I have a architecture diagram. We're gonna kind of flip over to this for a minute. And I'm gonna kind of go over how, where all the pieces are and kind of how all that flows together for a authentication flow. So on here, you'll see we have B2C users and we have B2B users. And the whole point of this is that no matter what type of users you have, you can delineate the login flow and how the users are managed throughout the entire ecosystem using cloud or on-prem, it doesn't matter. And we'll follow that through here. So all the B2C users are gonna have the A subset and the B2B or the B. So when a user goes to log in from the cloud, meaning from you know wherever they are, um, the first thing they're gonna hit from DNS, it's gonna resolve into an identity gateway. So that identity gateway is just like your traditional identity gateway. That's going to be your agent that sits on-prem or in the cloud. And that's going to handle the session management of the user to validate that the user has logged in. So what's going to happen is when the user hits the identity gateway, the identity gateway is then going to come up here and it's going to go to the Forgerock Identity Cloud and kick off the authentication journey. So when the authentication journey happens, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to attempt to contact the managed identity store and say, hey, authenticate this user with the credentials given to the managed identity store. Does it work? And in our case, we're gonna say, nope, it didn't because we never imported the users or in our case, we couldn't import the passwords, so therefore it will always fail. So now what's gonna happen is this authentication journey is then going to hit up this pass-through authentication node. Now, what this pass-through authentication node is gonna do is it's, and you're gonna use this for a lot of other stuff as well. So this, this, this one's actually really good. The pass-through authentication node is then going to pass the authentication onto something else. So what's happening is this pass-through authentication node, and here in this diagram, we have it going through a reverse proxy and then hitting a back-end user store, either the B2B user store or the B2C, depending on the user type. Now you can also pass this through the identity gateway and then go over to the identity store if you want to. Um, it's just, it's one of those things where, yes, it technically can do it, but I'm one of those sticklers where just because it can doesn't mean you should. I like the identity gateway to do what it's really meant to do, which is managing the authentication object for Forgerock sessions, not for just routing traffic, right? So when we do this simple bind, we're gonna route it through a proxy and then we're gonna hit the, the B2B user store and it's gonna come back and say, yes, the bind is successful. And then once that's done, it's gonna come back up. And now the second node that is gonna hit in the authentication journey is gonna be this patch object. So what that says is, hey, we've already validated that this is a correct username and password or whatever the authentication mechanism is. And now this patch object is going to update the password in the managed identity store in the cloud. So now you have the user object with the actual password stored. So the next time this user logs in and it makes this request to say, hey, here's username and password, it'll pass because the password is now stored in the managed object, which was kind of the whole point of this from the beginning. Once that's done, the authentication journey is gonna complete. I mean, obviously you'll probably have more stuff going on, but for all intents and purposes, it's now complete in this example. So we're gonna go back to the identity gateway with the forge rock session. Identity gateway is then going to, depending on the URL they're going for, pass them back to whichever application it is that they're trying to log into. 
And that's how all this stuff kind of ties together. And here's and that's how you can kind of sync your passwords if you can't get them into the cloud. There is bulk import with the Forge Rock Identity Cloud to import users via CSV file. You cannot import passwords that way. So password isn't even a field to import. So if you're thinking that's going to happen, it won't. Um, it's also limited. So if you have 10 million users, you're not going to use a CSV file, right? So what you can do, though, is you can set up a remote connector server here. And this is on the identity side, right? So this remote connector server you can set up with the identity cloud. And what it's going to do is pretty much what it sounds like, right? It's going to talk to your, let's say, a directory store. And it's going to synchronize just like any other kind of identity management reconciliation. So it's going to recon between your user store and the identity cloud in the realm. Now, this is where you got to remember, you only get two realms. So you may want to make your alpha realm, your internal users, your your beta realm, or Bravo realm, your, um, your external maybe customers or maybe... You know, some clients, they'll actually do all of their internal employees, contractors, everything as their alpha. And then Bravo, they use for purely customers because it's a completely different subset. You really got to think how you want to do your realms because you only get two. So that's just something to keep in mind. But the synchronization happens just like you would with normal on-prem Forge Rock. So you can set up your connectors, you set up the mappings, you set up your transformation scripts for the passwords to so convert them back from Base64 if you need to do that. Um, and... All of that is how this synchronization happens. So this is very similar to how you're already used to doing synchronizations. Um, now, one thing to note is the remote connector server. You can only set you have to set up one connector server for every data type. So you can't use a remote connector server to connect to an LDAP and then also connect to a database. So just something to keep in, in mind there. So that kind of covers how the identity provisioning aspect takes place, how the reconciliation act takes place, because the same thing, right? So when I create a new user, you can set up the manage identity store to provision to the remote connector server. Remote connector server will push down to the user store. Um, the authentication happens through the identity gateway. One thing I have noticed here is, you'll see on the right, is I have another box here for Strata Mavericks. Now the reason this is here is because this whole architecture diagram and what we were talking about was about moving away from legacy authentication and consolidating down to a single authentication source. So this particular client, they have Okta, uh, Ping Access, Ping Fed, uh, SiteMinder, and some custom homegrown stuff. And they want to consolidate all that down to use just the Forge Rock Identity Cloud. So they're like, well, how do we do that? And this is kind of what the idea was, right? So with the Okta, we just kind of replaced the access gateways with the identity gateway. So that, that one's kind of an easy swap out. Now for the ping fed and the site miner, that's a bit different. So you may not necessarily be able to just swap those out uh, depending on how you have them configured. And most of the time, especially on the site miner side, your applications, your individual apps, which would be like these things down here, these site miner ping apps, they're configured specifically for SiteMinder, meaning they're looking for like specific header SiteMinder headers or looking for ping, ping access and ping fed cookies and certain fields and data and all that. And they're, they're coded specifically for that. Now this is where it gets to be a pain in the butt, right? Now one app isn't really that big of a deal. You're like, oh, we have to reprogram this one app to redo handle how we handle, how we do authentication. So if we have this one app and we now have to say, we're just going to use, we're just going to connect over here, this identity gateway, we'll just handle it. And we're going to reconfigure this app to just use the Forge Rock session. Not a problem. But when you have hundreds of applications and teams and especially groups that don't want to do it, or you have applications where you don't even know where, who's managing the code, who owns it, or it's compiled, you may not even have the source anymore because, I mean, SiteMiner has been around for what, like 20 years now? And it's now end of life. So everyone has to migrate off. As of 2022, there is no more SiteMinder. So with that... Um, it makes it a real pain and costs a lot of money to get all those apps migrated. So that's why I kind of recommend using the Strata Mavericks. It's an extremely lightweight, fast and powerful orchestration layer. And what will happen is when the user authenticates, so after the authentication takes place and the, and the um, token is created by the identity gateway, we pass that object off to Strata. At this point, Strata will rework that Forge Rock token where it says, hey, this user is logged in, it's all good, and it will convert it into what a SiteMinder token or a session needs to look like or what the ping one needs to look like based on the application. So in this one JSON file, you can just set up and say, hey, if you're going to app number one, 
we want it to look like a SiteMinder cookie. And if we're going to um, app number two, we want it to look like a ping session or whatever. So now what happens is f Mavericks will flip that session to look like what the app needs, no matter what it is. And even though these legacy apps that are super old and they can only accept headers-based authentication, whatever, Mavericks can hold that in there. So you don't have to worry about reprogramming all these apps. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you literally, in one area, can just program how all the apps work. The backend apps never even have to know you're doing it, let alone have to redevelop and test and all that. You're good to go right out of the gate. So that's why I, I kind of recommended the Strata Mavericks to go in, into that spot. Obviously, it's not required to make Forge Rock Identity Cloud work. It's just one of those things where if you add that on, it just gives you a lot more power um, to integrate your applications. So... This is pretty much the gist of the Forge Rock Identity Cloud. Obviously, there's a lot more going into it. If you go into their backstage, there's a ton of um, self-guided classes that you can take on the Identity Cloud and on the Internet Gateway, or sorry, the Identity Gateway. So if you're really interested in that, I highly recommend going there because it will go into a lot of detail and in-depth. Um, just remember, there are some caveats. So if you're looking to migrate to Forge Rock Cloud, or if you're looking to just you know start there and you don't have anything just remember that there are some caveats to going to the cloud and it's not just forge rock identity cloud right so like i said all these cloud offerings are going to be limited in customizability so you you exchange that offer of ease of use with customization but doesn't mean it's not awesome it is actually a really great tool it works really well for what it says it does yes there's some quirks but they're all there um, overall, I think it's a great cloud product. I think they're doing a great job and it's only, I think like three years old. So they, they still have a lot, to, a lot of room to grow. So with that, that's the Forge Rock Identity Cloud. Hope this helped you understand a little bit what's involved and what's out there. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up anytime. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. You can hit me up on the comments in YouTube on here or follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok, all those fun things. We're going to be there for you everywhere. Anything else? Hit me up. I'll see you around. Later, guys.